Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the last two keynotes for the first day at the EKD 38 in Berlin. Um, it's a pleasure that you and everybody is still online, especially under these uh, certain circumstances here. Um, we will have two keynotes. Um, one is done, the first one by Lars Krückeberg, the second one by Thomas Spiegelhalter. And first, I would like to make an announcement again, um, which I also said already at lunchtime, that uh, we still from the EKD community would like to address that all young researchers under 35 who have submitted a paper um, also um, tell the moderators that they would like to participate in the Ivan Petro Petrovich Award. And secondly, um, once we close the last two keynotes, uh, we still have a wonderful bar online for social events, the most Eisley bar. Um, and uh, there we're going to have two wonderful live acts, actually one session directly streamed from Australia and the other one is a techno live set from Poland. My pleasure is now to introduce Lars Krückeberg. Lars Krückeberg studied architecture at the Technical University Braunschweig, Germany, the Universita Degli Studi di Firenze, Italy, and the German Institute for History of Art in Firenze, Italy. He graduated with a diploma in Braunschweig and received his Master of Architecture at the Southern Californian Institute of Architecture, Los Angeles, I think uh, probably most known as SIARC. And after visiting professorships also at the Aachen University of Hamburg and the RVTH Aachen, Lars has been a visiting professor in TU Delft in 2017 and 18. In 98, Lars established Graft in Los Angeles together with Wolfram Putz and Thomas Willemite. With additional offices in Berlin and Beijing, Graft has been commissioned to design and manage a wide range of projects. Graft has won numerous national and international awards and earned an international reputation throughout its existence. In 2009, the Graf founding partners co-founded Solar Kiosk together with Andreas Spies, which affiliate companies are incorporated in 10 countries worldwide today. The Solar Kiosk enables and empowers BOP communities worldwide with the provision of renewable energy services, products and solutions, thus creating both triple bottom line impact and profitable business centers. With Graft Brand Lab, Lars, Wolfgang and Thomas established a branding agency together with Linda Stanida in 2014. The agency operates in, at the interface of architecture, design and branding. Since 2015, Graf offers sustainable housing systems in modular design to construct accommodations for refugees quickly. The company called Heimer 2 was founded together with three other companies working in project development and communication. Lars, Wolfgang and Thomas together with Marina Bitha created the German pavilion with the topic Unbuilding Walls in Venice at the Biennale 2018. The theme Unbuilding Walls explored the architecture of division and inclusion. In 2018, Lars was selected as one of nine scholarship holders of the German Academy Villa Massimo Rome. Especially the social aspects which are addressed by Graf are of great interest as they contribute to the conference topic Anthropologic. These social aspects are the main reasons to invite Lars as keynote speaker at this year's IKD conference. Primarily the project Parametric Traumgestaltung, the redesign in, of intensive care units in hospitals is of great interest. The title of Lars' lecture today is Evidence-Based Design, How Algorithms and Good Architecture Can Heal. It is a pleasure to welcome Lars Krückeberg on stage. Thank you, Lars. Um, thank you, Dietmar. Can you hear me? Mic's on? Great. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Dietmar. Thank you, Liz, for inviting me. Uh, that was a long list <laughs> of things uh, that I have done, I guess. Um, today, I only talk about one little project, but uh, I think it's an interesting project, uh, maybe a little bit different uh, than what you have heard today and what um, this conference is about, but it might, well, you decide if it might make sense to you or not. I want to talk about 
evidence-based design today and about this project that Dietmar was mentioning in the end, um, Traumgestaltung, um, well, you will see in a second. I start with a quote. This is a quote by a famous um, painter, German painter who uh, lived uh, in the last century, um, who basically um, really put into drawings the, the devastating milieu of Berlin, especially Berlin, um, in a time where tuberculosis was everywhere, where people were disenfranchised, where the working class suffered. And they lived in very devastating conditions here in Berlin. So basically what he said is, yes, you can kill a person with an apartment just as well as with an ax. And I think that's a bold statement, but in a way, I think everybody would agree, yes, there's some truth to it. We ask ourselves, well, today it might be different, but if it is different, why don't we turn around that question or that quote? And the question is, can we heal with architecture? And then how would you do this? Without just saying, it's like, oh, we're going to heal things. I think it's the same thing. I think we have an understanding, all of us, that good architecture and a built environment that is healthy can contribute to the well-being of a person. I think we can all agree. But how do you prove this? How do you make it possible to actually make that statement? So it's not just, oh, yeah, I think it's better than the rest. There's a lot of things in our world in architecture is based on, I like it or I don't like it. So evidence-based design is something that we think is really interesting. So what is evidence-based design? It's a term that comes from medicine. In medicine, um, luckily for us, there are, there are not really questions, oh, I like it or I don't like it. It's fact-based. And evidence-based design is a term that comes from the 80s. And it was uh, a person like Ulrich in 84 that came up with that. He basically tried to see if a person in a hospital heals better if he has access to daylight. A simple question. And he would say, it's like, yeah, I mean, of course, you know. But the truth is not all, all hospitals and all beds have the same kind of proportion of daylight as you would think. So he, he did a research there and, he, you know, he basically said, yes, you can with the evidence of the window being there or not, you can actually have scientific facts if people heal better or they don't. Now, taking this as a starting point, it comes from medicine, but EBD, evidence-based design, is now applied to all kinds of disciplines. And we try to, to really bring it back into architecture, but on the grounds of um, being in a hospital. So we started something, nobody commissioned us to do this, but this question of can we prove that architects and designers can actually contribute to the healing of a person. Can we make this a fact? So we approach the Charité here in Berlin. The Charité is the oldest hospital that we have in Germany. It's one of the best, if not the best. It's also the hospital with their experts that are right now consulting our government on the pandemic um, that we have uh, globally. And they're doing a good job. So we approached them and told them, where can we help? How can we prove that this is possible? Oops, that goes too fast. So they basically said, well, maybe the best um, way to do this if we look at an ICU, in an intensive care unit. This is where people are in stress. This is where we have data. We need the data in order to you know, have the people survive and heal. So it's a data-driven process that is in, in a controlled environment. And the people need help. They need to heal fast because they're in stress, they're in pain. So I said, okay, what are the problems? And we then assembled a team um, with us, with the doctors of the Charité, but then a team of um, experts on sleep, experts on biology and what light does to your body. So we basically asked questions and invited experts to help us understand what we need to change in an intensive care unit. So not going into detail, but um, usually there is a lack of light. In a, usually um, in an intensive care unit, you don't have the natural light you need, which is a problem. If you don't have natural light throughout the day, your melatonin is not really being built up, meaning it's like you're sleepy all the time. You don't have enough um, light throughout the day, so you can differentiate if you are in delirium 
which is a stress moment for, for uh, patients. Uh, they're not awake, they're not asleep. They can't differentiate if it's night or if it's day. And that's a problem for them. The room is noisy. People go in and out all the time. People scream, oh, we need this, we need that. The machines that help you are noisy. The machines make gurgling sounds if you need, like in Corona, if you, if you are on intensive care, you need to be, um, um, you need oxygen, right? There is a gurgling sound in the back and there are signs that if you hear that, but you don't really know what's going on, you think you're drowning in your delirium. So people are under stress. Sound and visuals are the key factors that need to be addressed there. So we did this research, we established basically what need to be changed as parameters, and then we started designing with these people helping us. And that's the layout. So we tried to do something that these are four beds basically that you see there. The first thing that we did is let's have somebody control four people. He doesn't have to run in, he doesn't have to like change things. He's controlling it from the mid -sec section. He's controlling four beds. He only goes in when he actually needs to. It also is a factor of having less people. That's a side effect that's great though. You need less people in order to do the work. And we will come to that at the end uh, of this little lecture. So these four beds then are controlled, right? This is from the control room. You see the patients, you know what's going on. And this is now the moment where it became interesting. What we did, or what we realized, and I'll show this a bit more. One thing is the, the, the audio effect. Having the uh, machines being tucked away and not as noisy, less people going in. The other thing is light. We needed light that helps you, that helps you orient yourself, that helps you understand that this is noon right now, or it's actually night right now. When you're in stress, the movements of light become less. If you're in the delir, you still see things, but you don't know how to do this. So the lighting condition is something that is then directly um, linked to your vital systems. Meaning if you're in stress and you have sweat, your heart pumps faster, right? You, you have a, a pressure of, of the blood. This is registered closely and it is then translated in an algorithm to that light that is embedding you. And I'll show you in a second what that means. We basically have tucked away all of the equipment. We have the bed now in a, well, it's not a hotel room. <laughs> But it's closer to that, let's say. It's a controlled environment. And then you see this giant uh, light that is uh, above and before you. So light is, is a great thing. I mean, we worked with Philips on this one and says, oh, we have these systems of light. You're looking into the light, but the light is bright. You don't want to look at it directly. But that's the problem. If you don't look at it directly, it doesn't tell your brain it's daytime. But if you're submerged in light, meaning, the lighting feature is so big that you can't really escape it. It's so big that you, you're kind of uh, swimming in the light, then it can be less light. And then you can do things with the light. And the light is then linked to your vital system. So it, it will react immediately on basically your um, body functions. And we tested this out, what it means. At one point in the algorithm, we need to speed up, and meaning what the algorithm has to translate between your stress and what the lighting feature does to you. What kind of intensity, and this is how this looks like. Um, this is what basically it means if you wake up or you sort of wake up in the delir and you see different things above you. Um, it calms you down, the movement calms you down if you're in stress. It can go a little quicker, um, like um, clouds in the sky um, when you're there. Other features of you laying in bed, and when you're down there, you don't see somebody else, right? You're, you're by yourself, even though it's a two-bedroom uh, unit. The features of, you, you see this, um, this anchor that you need if you have to lift yourself up, that is on the side, it comes above you, almost like in a, in a factory almost, right? If you have to reach up, meaning if you are getting better, that you have the means uh, in order to communicate with other people, if you want to. Um, there's a little movie showing a little bit um, how big it is so you get a sense of it and what the patient actually sees. Again, you're submerged in light and that's really important. The other thing is what you can do with this lighting feature. Once you get a bit better, 
and there's really a response. The doctors can work with a patient in order, these are these gurgling sound machines, you know, when you think you drown, which are hidden away. Meaning, if you have a tablet, you can actually play with this uh, lighting thing. So cognitive training can be done so the doctor understands as well what your condition is, what you're already able to do, or what you're not able to do. Meaning, it's a learning tool. It's a laboratory that hopefully proves that you're getting better faster, but it's also a laboratory for the doctors to learn how to uh, deal with the patients. And um, basically, these are the results, and I know I have to come to an end, is that true? Um, these are the results. I won't go into uh, every single detail, but look maybe at um, the bottom here. Delirium incidence. In a normal ICU, that's on the left side, in a standard room, you have 76% of people being in a delir. And the delir means stress. It means more painkillers. Um, it means not as fast as a healing process as, as you would like. In our ICU, um, and that is a test that they did at the Charité for two years, we brought it down to 46%. The delir is not only a problem in your healing process. If you are getting into a delir, the chances that you have conditions later on that are not really good going back into your life um, is pretty high if you go into that. So we managed to bring it down by a third, I would say. Um, we also managed to um, have the people out of the ICU much faster than in a standard room. And that's not me now saying, you know, that's what we think happened. This actually is medical proof that the two years of studying in order to prove that the ICU actually works. And that, I think, is maybe the first I'm not so sure that I haven't really checked, but at least um, for us, it is the, the first given proof that architecture can heal. If you bring the right data together and you translate it into a synchronized system that then helps you. So this project uh, started in 2011. It went to 2014. It still goes on, meaning the laboratory is now used there in order for the, um, um, the doctors to understand how to even make it better, how to uh, use this algorithm in a way that it has even better um, outcome. So, and um, it's the first patent that we um, got through as uh, architects. The solar kiosk was impossible to, to get a patent because it's synchronizing a lot of different things, but you can't do a patent. We have a patent on this, actually. If somebody wants to build this, they have to ask us. Um, and that, maybe as a last slide, which I think is interesting. Ev Evidence-based design, basically, is something that we need in these days. Um, in a, in a post-factual world, we like to use facts in order to influence our design, to convince people that is the right way forward. And you can use the, the data of these evidence-based design in order to make design de decisions. So you measure things, then you master it, you, you, you take this and create a design out of it, and then you have a merit. And the merit is in the benefit, in this case, for the patients, but it's also a merit because the ICU working faster creates money for the hospital. And that is a huge factor in our systems. So we hope that this goes further and maybe at one point uh, there's a merit for us as well. Other than talking about it and being proud about it, um, maybe we, we actually make some money with that one day. But that was not the first idea. So this was uh, my lecture so far. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Lars. Really interesting project, especially in these special times. Um, do we have an answer from our audience? Just a quick question. Yep. If we try to separate the factors, put the light in the regular room and take out the light, would you have vibration? Because we, we, we presented some factors, but yes. we have two factors. One is the architecture, and the other is the lighting. So if you so we try to, because there were, it's like we need to do a lot of psychological studies on this, with the orientation. So can you try to work with uh, patients without the light, just with the architecture, emptiness? And can you try to introduce this kind of lighting in a regular room? 
yes, the question was, um, if we try to separate the different things like architecture, the environment, and the lighting, baldakin, um, as, a, as a separate tool, and then see what really are the factors. Uh, no, we haven't. And my question is, why would we? Honestly, I don't understand the um, differentiation between architecture and the lighting feature. That lighting feature is architecture, in my point of view. The, the main thing is not only testing what the light does to you, it's also how big it has to be in order to um, fill your, your um, uh, cone of vision when you're in a delir. So it's always spatial questions um, as well as, as lighting, as well as acoustics. It only makes sense, I think, in um, the whole scenario, actually, um, that then can be used as a lab laboratory. If you take it apart, um, where's the gain? Um, actually, the patent only also works because everything comes together at the same point. So, I, honestly, now we haven't tested it, but I also don't see why this would uh, help. Because, yes, the light is a major factor, as I said before. So it has to be there. The sound is a major factor, so it has to be there. Is really the surface that we picked the major factor? No, probably not. So, but how these parts are working together as a layout, also as a layout that works well in terms of control, bringing down the, as I said, the necessity to go in, so your control is remote, less sound. These all are architectural questions that only in the synergy of these makes sense. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think um, actually it's a quite realistic and good answer to the question, and um, of course we can debate further on it. But I think um, also probably we have plenty of students um, visiting online, and um, my question would be actually um, how have you as architectural office approached the charité, and um, how? Did you work together interdisciplinary, especially in developing the algorithm? And I think, if I'm correct, on the website you also acquired funding, right? So I think that's quite important for young architects. I mean, how to proceed as an architectural office with research? Right. Um, I think it's a very good question. Um, we realized when we did a pro bono project uh, back in America, it was a um, project to, to rebuild um, a part of a city in New Orleans after Katrina, um, that architects can actually, because of their profession being generalists, can put together things that answer questions without having somebody that, you know, commission them. Um, sometimes if you think you have a solution um, and you don't know the answer only by yourself, but as an architect you know who would help, you can bring together a team that actually tackles something. And um, I think that's, that's a great advantage for the profession of architecture. I don't know many professions that actually can do this, bringing completely different disciplines together to answer um, a very important question, tackle it, and really go forward. So uh, you need financing, but then we realized if you have an idea, you find the right people, and there are financing tools there as well. Um, no, the last page is not there anymore. It was financing from the German government that we applied for. We had a university, the, the Charité, and then us um, that applied for it. We had then Philips come on the team, and then our friends from Art and Com that are on the threshold of, um, well, let's say art and technology. And they're, they're great scripters as well. We asked them to help us in this translation because we can't write these algorithms ourselves. But that's not how I see my own profession. I see it more as an architect bringing together these kind of teams, get the financing in place, and then hopefully answering a question. And these are possibilities, especially you know, in a time where for a young architect it's really hard to, to break in. It was difficult before. I have the feeling, we talked about this uh, outside for a second, the competitions today, if they even are competitions. In America, we know that it's almost no competitions there, but in Europe there are, but you can't break in because you're never elected if you haven't done 
great work. Sometimes you can create your own work if you collect the right team, secure financing, and move forward. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I think it's a really good point because normally if you study architecture and you become architect later, it's not that you go out and you have three clients or that you have won the big competition and stuff. So to combine research uh, with an interdisciplinary team and over funding is also a good way. Um, we have one question from the online audience. Um, actually, we are two. Um, one is actually, how do you decide what amount of light or what kind of sound is good for the patients? That is a good question, and unfortunately, I'm not the right one to answer it. Meaning, this is why there is a team. There are doctors there, and they set up the, the two-year program in order to understand what the environment, the tools that we designed, based on the facts we had, how they operate. They did these tests. They tested what amount of light is correct, what kind of movement um, the patient is responding to depending on his stage of delirium or actually waking up. So um, yeah, they did, I mean, the test run was for two years. And in two years, they tested a lot of different scenarios. They did the decision. I, I can't say more because this is, would be a question for the doctor. Okay. Uh, another question would be in the direction also of evidence-based design. Um, as a scientific approach for healthy design, um, I really like your quote in the beginning that you can kill a human being with an axe as well with a house. And um, as this is an interesting quote, um, and it links also um, to our Anthropocene and climate change. So if we see the global planet, let's say, as uh, the bigger house or spaceship Earth, as Buckminster Fuller referred to it. So the question would be actually, um, is or hence action officially, officially is required for climate change, but what can we expect in future with advanced algorithms? That means, um, or directly, how would you transfer that, let's say, from the hospital, the knowledge to housing, for example? I'm pretty sure that Thomas will have something to say about that. Um, being exactly in that, as if I so correctly um, on the forefront of, of that kind of research. Now I think, um, again, it goes back to evidence-based design. Uh, work that uh, Chris Williams has done his, his whole life um, in using science, scientific work, in order to tackle a certain problem. And I think more and more as we use digital tools to communicate amongst our disciplines and professional architect to structure engineer to uh, um, HVAC, you know, if all that is on, a, on, a, um, on the same level of transferring data, you then are able to use algorithm, I think, to, um, to, to create a greater efficiency or find a solution between the gaps if you work closely together. I think uh, the great work uh, that you have been part of it was always a collaboration, meaning in the end, it's not the algorithm that tells you what to do. Uh, it is the collaboration between disciplines because it's always between disciplines. Maybe an architect can orchestrate because there's a vision, but usually in my experience, if you want to do something great, you have to have great partners, otherwise it won't work. Architecture is too complex. But there, if you have the same language, let's say that is digital, you can allocate problems that nobody tackled before. If the, ar the architects you know, ask the right question, Maybe even because he has beauty in mind, not even um, efficiency of how you recycle water or how you um, reuse your energy. Um, maybe it's just beauty. There will be a response. The great thing about the state, and I'm, I'm really, uh, since I studied in Braunschweig and I was doing my diploma by hand with coloring, with wax colors, and it was really beautiful, right? I went to SciArc and everything switched to the computer. It was like, oh, wow. And since then, I mean, we progressed. You know, I, I graduated from SciArc in 98. This is a long time ago. Today, we are able to use the computer as a common language where it's much easier to tackle problems if you ask the right questions. But it's still the same thing. It's collaboration. And it's, in a way, um, people that are making decisions. What is the right question? What should the algorithm do? The algorithm doesn't do it for you. And you still, even if you apply it, have to make decisions like, when do you decide how much light is enough or not? Meaning the human interaction and learning and making decisions is still in place, luckily. Yeah. 
No, um, I think I can totally agree. It's also like at the moment probably we are in the position that we still, you know, have to find the right question. And with that we address the algorithm which needs to be written. And um, maybe we're not too sure what will be there in future with AI, but still AI also needs to be programmed by human beings. But I, I, I think um, it has been a really good answer and also understandable. Um, we have a few minutes left and I would like to refer to one question from the audience. Um, maybe if somebody can switch in the third question. Please. Ah, there we go. So, because I think it's also quite interesting and also um, quite actual. So, the question is, um, do you see a problem in patenting light, especially on times of corona, on which particular part is the patient? The patent. The patent, the patent yeah. um, I'm not sure if I understand the, the question correctly. We don't have a patent on light. <laughs> we have a patent on a very specific um, laboratory in conditions of spatial, acoustical, and, and lighting information. So, um, and that's it. So if you want to do something similar, yes, you would have to ask us to collaborate or help or whatever. Um, if you want to do light, you do light. What is interesting, though, is that Philips, you know, it's always the big guys. They were partners in that. And now they're taking this further without us and try to do similar things that we actually designed without us. So at that moment, a patent is actually a good thing to work maybe against the big guys that take it from you, saying it's like, well, you have to include us. You can't do it by yourself, uh, only because you're part of this uh, gesture. So we didn't patent light. Uh, yeah. That field is enormous. Uh, and we have done one specific um, situational um, laboratory that is patented. That's, that's all. Yeah, maybe um, it's also a difficult question because um, it's quite ethical, you know, um, having all those intensive care units worldwide with coronavirus and that stuff. But then it might be also a question, I mean, uh, for example, if uh, General Electric and all those companies, are they giving their machines for free? Uh, maybe they should. I'm not too sure about it, but um, I think it's quite political and um, probably can't answer this today on stage and it also links maybe to that what Chris was saying this morning about multinationals and languages and that stuff. So it's difficult. I think it's a very interesting question and um, I think one thing is also that nobody should work somehow for free but I mean in times of corona you have developed a system which really helps people and I think that's a great thing and as you said it's uh, taken further by Philips and Maybe um, can you estimate if it's been implemented also in other hospitals or? Uh, not that I know of. Um, again, uh, just the light feature is being taken forward by Philips and we're in talks with them. Um, but then the, 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 it's more the, the, the whole setup. You can't just take this apart from it. It's, it's part of this, the setup. Um, to, to say something, I mean, we're architects. And I think uh, as architects, we can be part of great answers to complicated solutions. And I think we should be paid for it. Um, I, I think we shouldn't take it for granted that we're designing things. We shouldn't take it for granted that uh, we're in competition, not being paid, and people just you know, take bits and pieces of it and do something else with it. It's really hard to patent or guard design. We all know that. It's really difficult. But then you should, I think you should try. The main thing is, are you contributing to a solution that helps society? It helps people in an intensive care situation, meaning maybe this setup would help. That, that We just asked ourselves the other day, I, d I don't know if corona patients are actually in our ICU. I don't think so, um, but there would be an interesting uh, question, actually. Um, but the ICU that we know can help. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, we got funding for it. We did it. If this would be built somewhere else, it benefits the hospital, and we know all that our... Um, health systems are very heavy. It's, it's, it's hard to do this kind of stuff because it costs so much money. If you find a tool to heal people faster, it benefits the patient but also the system. Right? There's nothing wrong in, in doing something better and making money out of it. In this case, the hospital, yeah. if it benefits the patient because the, it can be cheaper. 
No, um, I think, um, yeah, that answers the question and um, also, as I said in the beginning, why we also invited you um, also with the social aspects like the solar kiosk and all the other projects. I think it's quite logical and it's also nice and contributes really um, to the topic of the conference. And beside that, I think it's interesting to see how certain, let's say, research idea gets directly implemented with architecture and even, you know, measured as evidence-based design and you get the proof of it. That's quite amazing and thank you, Lars, uh, for your time being here and um, I hope we will see then future kind of projects by the office. And we will continue now with my colleague, Liz Werner, introducing Thomas Spiegelalter.